This man committed one of the most heinous crimes against women in Ireland. This story takes us to Ireland and to a town in the north side of Dublin called Blanchardstown. It is a residential area with some attractions including the Blanchardstown Shopping Centre and the Aquazone. Between 2003 and 2019, the locals of Blanchardstown have seen 95,000 criminal incidents, making it the top four of the most dangerous places in Dublin. But take that with a pinch of salt. The population of around 95,000 people are for the most part friendly. This brings us back to December of 1995. Marilyn Wren was 40 years old. She was an employee in the Department of the Environment in the National Roads Authority Division. And she had never married. She lived in Brookhaven Drive in Blanchardstown, just around the corner from her brother and his family. And she was like a second mother to her nieces and nephews. She spent much of their young lives babysitting them. She was a loving, friendly and thoughtful person who loved sports and being around her family. In the run-up for her Christmas break, Marilyn had a busy week. On top of doing her last bits of shopping for Christmas, she had lots of social events planned over the Christmas period. On Monday the 18th of December, she had dinner with her brother Stephen, his wife Catherine and their kids. Marilyn turned 41 that week, and he made a cake for her birthday. On the following day, Marilyn went into town after work, for a few social drinks with friends. On that Wednesday, Marilyn was with Catherine, her sister-in-law, and they were wrapping presents and talking about their plans over the Christmas. And after work on Thursday, Marilyn had more plans. She was going to her war Christmas party. And on Friday, her friend was meeting her in town for a catch-up. Her plans for Christmas Day was to go to her parents' house on Christmas Eve and stay the night. And then she would wake up, have some Christmas breakfast, go to church and stay for Christmas dinner. Marilyn's calendar was full up. She was a busy woman over the Christmas period. And when Thursday the 22nd of December came around, she was really looking forward to going out for her job's Christmas party. She was looking forward to a few drinks and socialising with her friends. She went to work that day as usual. She left her office on Waterloo Road with a friend at about 6pm. From there, they made their way to a pub on Tara Street in Dublin city centre and this is where she met up with a few more colleagues. They had a few more drinks here and then they all made their way to the Sheeling Hotel in Rahini, where they would have dinner, drinks, and some dancing afterwards. Marilyn was in good form, chatting with friends over drinks, and talking about Christmas. The music stopped at 1am, and Marilyn walked to a taxi rank with another colleague, mentioning that she was hoping to meet with former colleagues from her previous job. Marilyn was then seen in Eddie Rocket's diner on O'Connell Street. She was seen by a former colleague, Frank Galler, who was there with three other people. When Marilyn left Eddie Rockets, she said she was going to catch the Night Link bus home. This is a public transport bus that runs late into the night from the city centre into different locations. She was due in work the next day, but she never showed. No one was too concerned and thought she might have had a late night. 11am the same day, a colleague called her just to see if she was coming in and to make sure everything was okay. But there was no answer, and everyone just assumed she was still in bed. Marilyn's family, they couldn't get a hold of her either, but as she had a busy Christmas schedule, they didn't worry about it. Marilyn was due to meet her brother on Christmas Eve, and they would drive to their parents' home, which was a Christmas Eve tradition, but she never showed. On the next day, Christmas Day, she never showed for mass either. The family now began to get worried. And rightfully so. On St. Stephen's Day, which is the 26th of December, Stephen went to her house, which is empty, and called around to her friends and colleagues, looking for information on where she was. Stephen then went to Blanchestown Garda Station and reported his sister missing. And by that stage, it was realised no one had seen Marilyn since her work party. Gardy began an investigation and spoke to witnesses. One was a 13-year-old neighbour of Marilyn's and he said he seen Marilyn on Friday the 22nd of December, the day after the party. 
He said she left her house and walked to the nearby bus stop and waited for a bus. From this, it was thought Marilyn got a number 38 bus at about half 12 in the afternoon. A friend of Marilyn said she called her on Friday morning and they made plans to meet in a pub in the city centre that evening, but she never arrived. Marilyn last withdrew money from her bank account the day before the Christmas party and there was still Christmas presents wrapped and ready underneath her Christmas tree. It was very out of character for Marilyn to just disappear on her own accord. On Saturday the 30th of December, a body was found on Dolly Mount Stride and Gardy were anxious to identify the body quickly as there were a number of women who went missing in the area the same weekend. A woman in her 20s went missing from the same area as Marilyn and searches were still ongoing for a case we covered, Jojo Dullard, and she was from County Kilkenny, who has still to this day never been found. The body found on the beach was later identified as Denise Byers and she went missing from Port Marnock. A new appeal was then issued for Marilyn with the clothes she was believed to be wearing on the day she vanished. A red blouse, a black skirt and a green coat. A more specific appeal was made on Saturday the 6th of January and Gardy wanted to speak to two taxi drivers. They also appealed to people on the Nightlink bus heading toward Blanchestown to come forward, as well as anyone who had been in Eddie Rockets on O'Connell Street between 2 and 3 a.m. As Gardy were reviewing information in the early stages of the investigation, they had gathered the witnesses that said they had seen her on the Friday. One said she was wearing the same clothes she wore to the party on the Thursday, and Gardy gathered it would be very unlikely she would wear the same outfit to work or anywhere the next day. The witnesses had mixed up the days they had seen and spoke to Marilyn and now the Guardian had to focus if Marilyn even made it home that night and if something happened to her on the way home. With this, Guardian decided to search Talca Park. If Marilyn took the Nightlink home, she might have taken a shortcut from Blanchardstown village to her estate. The alternative route would have added 20 minutes onto her journey. It was a popular cut through but the park was known as an anti-social hotspot so Marilyn could have opted for the longer route to avoid any unwanted encounters. When the search began, dog units followed shortly behind and about 15 minutes into the searches, at around a quarter past nine, one of the dogs alerted to something. They found the naked body of a woman lying face down with her clothes piled up nearby. These clothes matching the ones Marilyn was wearing when she was last seen. Her handbag was also found in the area with money inside it, along with her bank cards and ideas. It was confirmed to be Marilyn and the body had been there for nearly a week and determined she was either killed where she was found or close by. By Sunday evening, the post-mortem results returned, confirming Marilyn had been raped and strangled. I forgot to mention that on January the 7th, 1996, is where Marilyn Wren's body was found. The scene was calm to try obtain any evidence, while door-to-door -door inquiries took place in the surrounding areas to see if any of the residents heard or seen anything unusual on the night she was last seen. Some neighbours reported hearing screams in the park near to 4am on the Thursday night, but they put the noise down to people coming home drunk from parties. While the investigation was in its early stages, Marilyn's funeral took place on Tuesday the 9th of January in St. Matthew's Church in Ballyfermot. It took place near to where she grew up and where her parents still lived. A thousand people crammed into the church to pay respects to Marilyn. As the investigation progressed, Gardie began to gather a list of men in the area who had convictions of sexual crimes. CCTV footage was also gathered but nothing was found. The Guardi were hoping to find forensic evidence to help them in the investigation. The theory was Marilyn was followed home then attacked in the park. Guardi also urged the public to report anyone they knew who had fresh scrapes on their hands or face as the attack happened in a thorny bush in the park. 70 Guardi were working the case. Numerous tips had been given of men who had fresh cuts and scrapes 
and the Guardi began compiling a short list of 10 men who could be potential suspects. On Monday the 15th, RTE's Crime Line program aired the reconstruction of Marilyn's last known movements. With this, the police received multiple calls, and one of these calls was from a man who could confirm Marilyn was on the same night link as him the night she disappeared. But the witness could not elaborate. It was likely most of the people on the bus were out drinking that night, and the memories would be foggy. On the 29th of January, three men were brought into the Garda station for questioning, but released later that night, and the Garda told the public they were not likely to face charges. And at this point, Garda focused on DNA and forensic evidence to lead them in the right direction. Semen had been found on Marilyn's body, however the samples would have to be destroyed after six months if no charges were filed. By the beginning of February the case went cold and the Guardi had hit a wall and in March 1996 they began going over the evidence again and starting from zero. While reviewing some statements of what people had said they were doing around the time of the disappearance, Gardy came across some inconsistencies in the statements of one man. He said that he had been in Blanchestown that night, and he had walked through the park, but he hadn't seen Marilyn. He did however see a jogger in the park that no one else reported seeing that morning. He also reported to Gardy that he got home at about 10 to 5 that morning but he had been spotted nearby to his home by a neighbour at about quarter to four. Gardy were suspicious and asked him to provide a DNA sample, which he did. Finally, on Tuesday the 8th of August 1996, eight months after Marilyn Ryan was killed, an arrest was made in the case. There had been a match in the DNA samples provided by the 32-year-old man Gardy found inconsistencies with. His name was David Lawler and at the time of his arrest he was married with one child and another on the way. He was originally from Baltinglass, County Wicklow and worked as a technician in a phone company. He and his wife lived in Blanchetown, County Dublin, just minutes away from Marilyn's home. When he was brought into the police station he made a full statement. David Lawler, who had also been out celebrating his Christmas party with his job in Dublin city centre, he said he left the party at midnight and walked to the north side of the city. He got himself a bag of chips from the chipper and he realised there was no chance of a taxi. He then made the decision to walk home. When he arrived to Blanchestown village, he seen the night link bus was dropping people off and here he noticed Marilyn and she was walking on her own. He was walking in the same direction and he followed behind her. When they were walking alone and isolated, he took his chance and attacked her. He said he had an uncontrollable urge to rape her. He grabbed her from behind and pulled her into the bushes, just by the river. And after the violent assault, Marilyn said she recognised him from around the area, so he strangled her. He told Gardy that he went home, took off his bloody and muddy clothes and washed them and then he went to bed. On the 13th of August, days after his arrest, he was granted bail and would stay in his parents' house in County Wicklow. On Monday the 26th of January 1998, after being in and out of court and on continuous bail, David Lawler finally appeared in the Central Criminal Court to hear his fate. There would be no trial in relation to the killing and rape of Marilyn Wren, and David Lawler was intending to plead guilty. He was then sentenced to life in prison. The hearing was just 10 minutes long. Marilyn's family remained calm but visibly upset. Her brother spoke to the reporters present. He said, I'm glad it's over, but nothing could bring Marilyn back. It had been a difficult two years. After the court proceedings finished, David Lawl was handcuffed and brought to prison to see out his sentence. David Lawler would be brought back up in the media in 2001 when a former schoolmate of his, also from Baltinglass County Wicklow, was arrested for a horrific sexual assault. That man was named Larry Murphy, a man who has been suspected to be involved in at least one or more of the cases I previously covered. 
David Lawler has been in prison for the murder of Marilyn Wren for 23 years, longer than an average life sentence of 18 years. While there has been no news of him being spotted out in the public, he may have been granted temporary day release and could very well be walking among the public. This is another brutal and cruel murder against an innocent woman walking alone. Although our country is small with a population of around 5 million people, crimes against women has not got any better and it remains a problem to the women of Ireland and all around the world. Thoughts go out to the Rin family, hopefully after all these years they can find peace in the fact that a killer was brought to justice. Thank you for watching, I will see you in the next one.